Hello, everyone. Welcome on Spreaker.com on For Agree or Disagree, the podcast, the uh, Lockdown Happy Hour, and about to go on Facebook Live here as well. And hello, everyone watching on Facebook Live. Uh, it is Agree or Disagree, the podcast. It is our Saturday edition. Uh, our lockdown happy hour, long weekend, Easter weekend edition. Hope you are all having a great weekend. Um, so you can comment here on anything that you've heard, things that we are uh, talking about. We have a few topics to get into here today. And joining, as always, hello, Deirdre. How are you in Strathmore today? I'm good, Kevin. We have some sunshine. Wow. As, yeah. Okay. Correct me if I'm not so happy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, I I heard a rumor there is snow somewhere in Alberta. Is that true? Calgary. Calgary yeah, has snow. Yeah. yeah, we got hit yesterday. Mm. Nice. Mark. <laughs> Again. Yes. If you if you don't like the weather in Calgary, it's always wait a minute. Mark Taylor, how are you doing? Um, I'm ignoring the snow outside. That's why the blinds are closed. As, um, as much as people love to point out, it's like, this is normal for April. I still hate it. So, Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, and also we have Kristen Rayworth as well. How are you doing, Kristen? I'm good. How are you? I am. Uh, I'm not my super self today. Uh, I had a really intense week of getting an assignment done, which included a research paper, which I've never written a research paper before. And it's not writing so much. It's the APA style guiding stuff that I had to make sure was down to the T. And yeah, that was fun. But other than that, uh, I'm glad it's over. The semester's pretty much over. And now I'm somewhat free. So yay for me for that. Um, yay. The... Uh, I guess one of the things I, I've been a little bit, I was just saying to everybody here, I was off a little bit to, uh, as to what was going on in Twitter and Chris to remind me, it's just the same old swamp, but, uh, I understand that there has been an issue about golf courses. Am I led to understand this? Can someone explain to me what is going on in, with Alberta and golf courses? So, uh... A lot of it is focused on Edmonton golf courses, from what I can understand. But basically what it is, is that the golf courses were gearing up to open, despite the pandemic, uh, because they believed that they could institute the physical distancing rules uh, effectively and that people would be far enough away from each other that it would not be an issue. Uh, Dr. Dina Hinshaw has said that they are not an essential service and they cannot open. And they have been, it seems like, advocating very hard to the government to change that uh, direction. And and they have now, they've been in the media over the weekend talking about how they believe that they are an essential service. And so it started a whole, whole to-do between anti and pro golf course opening people. <laughs> okay. Uh, fascinating. Um I, I'm I'm hard pressed to imagine how golf is okay, and I precursed this by saying I am not a golf fan, um, uh, but I know that some people are. But so I'm a hard I'm going to be biased and suggest that golf is not an essential service at this particular point in time. I mean, the argument that they made was around you know the mental health, the positive mental health components of getting outside and being physically active, and of course. <laughs> But no other sport is considered a essential service. Other sporting teams aren't able to, the community leagues, all of those things aren't able to to get up and running. So I see no reason why golf would be treated differently than any of those other sports. Because yes, absolutely, it's important for mental health, but we need to find different ways of doing that right now. Mark, Mark, Deirdre, did you have anything to add to that? Well, I can't, I can't argue with the logic of it's not... A, an essential service because it's not and I say that as someone who thoroughly enjoys you know hitting my ball well into the woods and never be found again um, I'm out as much as I can be throughout the summer to golf but you know I'm, and part of me was actually looking forward to the golf season maybe starting before everything else but um, it is what it is um, I don't I think people are just looking for reasons to be upset about things more than anything else. And so, you know, 
there are people who aren't practicing social distancing that thought maybe this would be a way to get around it. Oh, we can go and golf. We get, we're, we're never stand next to each other anyway, so it won't be a big deal. But, you know, very, very few foursomes are four people living in the same house right now. So that's that's the the hook of it all is how how are you going to ensure that the the four people playing are practicing social distancing before they get to the golf course how are you enforcing that throughout the the answer is you're not and so it's just easier that that doesn't happen yeah i have to agree there it's i i think i think there may be some jealousy because didn't bc have a few golf courses that opened up this weekend uh, I didn't hear that. Um, I know that there was discussion around it, but I don't think anything. I don't. I'll have. I don't recall hearing that anything specifically opened. Um, I don't. I don't know. I don't. I. I would think that that would have been met with the same condemnation that it would have been in Alberta, uh, but I. I don't know. Um, but I guess it leads maybe to something that Mark says and sort of about uh, Bonnie Henry on Tuesday had to come out and explain something uh, because her hair looked a little bit different than it did on Saturday <laughs> and on Monday. And here's what she had to say. Um, that has been brought, brought to my attention. And they say the, the number one thing not to do in a pandemic is your own hair. And I will say, believe them. And uh, my apologies to Lindsay, my, my hairdresser, but I did do some of my own tinkering with my hair in the last couple of days. So, yes, I did not go to the hairdresser. Yes, so people are observing <laughs> Bonnie Henry's hair from Saturday to last Tuesday and noticed that there was a difference. Uh, and I have to admit that I um, got caught a little bit in this as well because uh, there was a report coming out uh, on last yesterday that I saw that BC Ferries was as busy as they have been, they are, uh, you know, they're experiencing capacity sailings, uh, they're still moving, which led me to feel a little bit frustrated that people are still going on a ferry, even though there are seven, a hundred different quotes from a bunch of people saying now is not the time to travel, but... Uh, Bonnie Henry talked about it today. They, she said that they are they are at a running at a fifty percent capacity for what's they're filling the ferry. They are at a lower schedule. So, and she also argued that most people are actually performing uh, are doing what is being complied because again she was asked about enforcement. Um, are we? Feel, are you noticing more people feeling like they are the social distance police? Um, or is it a fact of the other side of this is people just are feeling very frustrated that we are in this situation and wanting to get out of it as quickly as possible? <clears throat> For me, it's the, the, the question came up was why was this even an issue? Like, like we, we've talked about, well, we, we as a group haven't, but You've heard to topics time and time again that, you know, if you got nothing to say about a female politician, comment on her appearance. And, and, and this goes back to something we were talking about is why do our medical officers need an official opposition? Like they're providing a public service and your first comment is, did you go to a hairdresser? Like, really? That's what you're taking from this is she cut her hair. Like, it, it, I actually had to Google this when you mentioned this was when you go to the topics. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about, Bonnie <laughs> Henry's hair? Like, like, is there some weird meme going on? Did she come out with a mohawk? I, no. I was legitimately <laughs> like, thought actually that Bonnie Henry's hair would have been a, a Twitter account. Actually, it was. It got <laughs> such a storm on, and mostly for humor sake. But it, it, you know, but it it, it 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 was a conversation of quite quite humorous on on Twitter. And I just I thought it was really sweet how she handled it. This I thought she handled it very well. But anyway, go continue. I'm just going to pick up on what Mark said. She shouldn't have had to have handled it at all. Like it it should not have even been a thing of course she's not going to the salons first of all they're closed secondly she's not an idiot like every person out there especially women who you know i've cut my own bangs already i've i've adventured into ways of maintaining my eyebrows 
So there's been <laughs> lots of stuff I've been trying to do to maintain this. And everyone is going through that. And I, so it's just kind of ridiculous that, yeah, except for Mark. I started cutting <laughs> the bangs and I just kept going. You know? <laughs> But like, everybody is everybody's going through that, so it's just it's silly, and it would not, it would never have come up if it was a dude. Like if it was a man who had shaved his beard, I don't think there would be a massive internet response to that. With the exception of Justin Trudeau, yes, yes. Right. yes. he grew a beard. His, <laughs> yeah, his beard is a is is a thing. Yes, yeah. I think too that um, you know I think that there's. There's a lot of people who are kind of wondering how how serious really is this? Still, still, yes, with everything going on, I think there are still a lot of people who are like, you know, it's not really that serious. So I, in a way, too, I think that people are looking for any opportunity to say they're not doing it. I don't have to do it either. So, like, I think it's unfortunate, but I think that's probably a, a, a reality right now is that people are looking for an excuse to not have to follow the rules. So they're definitely going to be looking for it in the leaders. Going, uh, yeah, they're not doing it, so I, I don't have to. And I think. Is it partly because they're seeing, on average, this week in BC and Alberta, on average... I think the the highest was in the 40s that they're looking at it and saying, well, really, it's not as bad as people are making it out to be. Yeah. And you're seeing a higher yeah. recovery rate. And it's like, and even when, J, we'll get into Jason Kenney's performance during the modeling, but one of the things that it's, you looked at the 20 to 29 number, like the younger people num number, it was in the, it was at two so I guess maybe some people would might be looking at things like that and saying, I, I don't, I don't see how this is this, how is this really affecting me? Honestly? Like, I feel like I'm not part of the problem. I'm not saying they're right. I'm just giving that as a, is that a possible perception out there? I, I think it's more so than that. It, there is that. Absolutely. There are people who don't think that this is as big a deal, but there's also a lot of people who live in apartments. There's a lot of people who live by themselves. There are a lot of people who this is now going into week week four of being on lockdown, being by themselves, being stuck in their apartments, not having access to the outside. I think you're seeing a lot of people just act out their frustrations and they're because it is it's very tough. I mean, speaking as someone who lives in an apartment and is single, it can be I go on walks, social physically distancing walks, but it is really hard. It's very frustrating to feel just stuck in 800 square feet. And I can understand how people would say, would be pushing their boundaries now, especially as it starts to hopefully eventually get nicer. People are going to keep doing that because it's a struggle. It's hard. And it's very difficult when it's not impacting you directly to, to understand why you have to live within these confines of these rules. But that was always going to be the paradox of this whole situation is that, if we didn't take it seriously, people would get hurt and death rates would be much higher. We take it seriously and everyone's now looking going, oh, it's not that bad. Why, why did we do all this? Like, it's, they, you know, and you just have to, like, I don't understand why more people aren't looking up the border going, oh, had we done that, this would be a lot worse. We're yeah. not, we're not doing, like, we always hear people comparing, oh, why aren't we doing what they did in Thailand? Taiwan or, or uh, Iceland. Why don't we look at what's new going on in New York? Like they're, they're announcing, like we just uh, got the numbers here today. We didn't even have a hundred cases in Alberta today. They're having more, a person die like every 10 minutes yeah. in New York. Yeah. Like that, that, that the scale of magnitude is not even close anymore. Yeah. 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 I, too. Go oh, ahead. Go ahead. I wonder too, if it's a, uh... If there's something like, remember how we were told uh, very often at the beginning, the uh, the risk to Albertans was low. The risk to Canadians was low. So I wonder if it's possible that people are kind of going back to that a little bit and saying, okay, look, so the risk was always low. It isn't that bad. But even so, I mean, 
if you want to segue into uh, Kenny's modeling, the thing that got me when I looked at, because I was in the, the technical briefing for, uh, for press on Wednesday, and the thing that got me was when I looked at, was when I looked at the, uh, the charts, it's showing that, that we're not going to hit that peak until uh, the end of May. That's, that's the, traje- the trajectory do, do that we're on. you have the actual PowerPoint? Yeah, if it, yeah, we got a copy of it. Oh, good. I, uh, so love, love a copy of that. I will forward it right now. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we had the, so we had the the copy, and it was like I, like it was it was actually a little bit uh, was a little overwhelming to see because you know we have been watching our numbers because our numbers are kind of going down a bit and it's starting to look better, but then but their model that shows no, this is only going to get worse until the end of May. That was kind of a bit of a shock to me because it was finally when you realized that this hasn't even really started yet. I mean, it has, right? We've been, kids have been out of school since the 15th of March in Alberta. And uh, it's, so it feels like it's been a while, but we're, we haven't even really started it yet. So that was, that was a little bit much, a little hard to watch, I guess. Yeah, uh, w- let's get into the modeling part. So, uh, the TV address that Jason Kenny gave on uh, Tuesday night was met with uh, perceived probably a pretty public. This felt like a really statement. This was the premier. He, you know, um, basically said, "We're not going to sugarcoat this. Uh, this is." you know, all, all that sort of stuff. Um, I'll see if I could find that where, while we're talking here, but the, the modeling presentation, just the overall presentation, I, I'm going to start here with a little bit of a frustration that I had. Um, I think that there is very much a very valid constructive criticism around the presentation skill and how it, the information was conveyed for sure it did from what i saw felt very confusing but i also was a little perplexed why people were upset that he rolled up his sleeves or was using a powerpoint particularly where i don't think every government was using a powerpoint and now i i do think and yeah i'll i'll love to hear from you i do think we needed to hear more from dr hinshaw during the modeling presentation but I really felt that some of the criticism towards Kenny, I felt was a bit much. Was I the only one there or? That's how welcome, welcome to Alberta. Government. Yeah, like, <laughs> well, of course, but. Criticism of Kenny is a bit much. Is like the theme of, of AB Ledge. I can't believe Jason Kenny tied his shoe. <laughs> Probably tied yeah, it to beat his heart. That's what AB yes. Ledge would say. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, it can it can be a bit much. Um, you know, I we talked about oh, okay. I talked about this with someone. Now, now I don't even know what day is what and who I'm talking to. But I think it was every day is Sunday, was, right? Yeah, yeah, I think I I had the I did the podcast with Robbie and we talked about the the premier's address and and we talked about actually how the majority of other premiers in the country are kind of staying out of this part, right? The health is delivered by the health uh, officials or health information is delivered by health officials and premier stuff remains with the premier. Um, that's not what's happening here. And I think it is It is frustrating. It's frustrating on a number of levels because people trust Dr. Hinshaw, right? I, I don't think... I don't think we have a whole bunch of UCP supporters who refuse to trust Dr. Hinshaw. That is actually not the same as when Jason Kenney gets up to speak. There's a lot of people that don't trust that he knows what he's talking about. There's a lot of people that don't trust what he's saying. And yeah, I think it's, I think it's really difficult to, to try and be a, um, to try and be seen as someone that you can trust when the rest of the time it is partisan politics and trust it, trust is an issue. So I think every other province has kind of done a good job with keeping those separate. 
personal opinion. Um, yeah, it, it certainly <laughs> it, it has been, it has only, like, when it's Bonnie Henry time and Adrian Dix time, it is only Bonnie Henry and Adrian Dix at that time. And if they have any other announcements on anything else, that usually is done at noon. And Horgan does some of them, but he doesn't do all of them. He's been a bit more off camera. I don't want to say less hands on more off camera than Jason Kenny has. I, I don't know how on hand, how much hands on Horgan has been, but Kenny has been certainly more on camera than Horgan for sure. I, I also think that some of this is based on people's like a DJ kind of talked about people's preconceived feelings on Kenny because mm-hmm. Doug Ford has been just as out, out there. Doug Ford was the one who released their numbers when they released their modeling. Doug Ford spoke first. He spoke first before the health expert did and everybody and their dog was like, Doug Ford's great. Everything he's doing is great. <laughs> and then Jason Kenny does the same thing. And they're like, Jason Kenny's the worst. <laughs> so, I mean, they're, in some ways, that the, the heavy partisan environment that we were already in has not shifted with this. I think also no. this is a testament to the kind of politician that Jason Kenny is in the sense that he is a he's very hands-on very like he is he talks to anyone who knows him or has worked for him, with him or worked around him he touches everything like he's very 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 hyper involved and very in, in everything that goes on around him whether it was the platform development or this and so this is this is very consistent with that I do think that the address itself was was great i think we could could have probably done with just maybe that part yeah and not yeah. the next day <laughs> um because the address was hit every note it had every note perfectly and then when it talked about the recovery i think that's an incredibly important thing that we all need to start talking about and moving our minds towards because that's going to be the, one of the biggest monumental tasks of our country in our in our generation in our lifetime is to see mm-hmm. how how this government is going to come back from this many job losses and this kind of a hit to the economy. And so it was good that he, he emphasized that and emphasized hope and told his story about Buffalo, even though we don't have Buffalo here, we have bison. (laughs) I don't think that was a mistake actually, but (laughs) no, no, of course it wasn't. It's Jason Kenny using the word Buffalo and you know, that's all it took. (laughs) But um, so I kind of I kind of look at things through a slightly different lens. I I expected the the partisan crap to be the partisan crap. Um, you know, Jason Kenny is the root of all evil and our savior at the same time. Um, <laughs> depending on who you're talking to, what I what I saw with the the evening announcement of where things were going, I saw a couple different things. I saw Jason Kenny reaching out through a medium that isn't Twitter because not we, as we talked about last week, not everybody gets their news from Twitter. There is a large chunk of the large chunk of the population, particularly in Alberta, particularly conservative voters, who don't actually believe this is a thing. And so you needed to have Jason Kenny stand up and talk to those people and say, This is real. This is coming. Bad things are happening with us. By the way, some other bad things are gonna happen too. And that was also politically savvy because if there's going to be bad news. You be the leader and tell everybody it's coming. So he's already prepped people for a high unemployment rate, for a massive deficit, which is totally against the UCP ways, uh, the debt that's going to come with it. He has laid all this groundwork out so nobody from the NDP camp can come back and say, well, you didn't tell us. You lied to Albertans. No, I stood on TV and told them we're going to be running a stupid freaking deficit this year. So all that was politically savvy, and so I was really – I thought that was smart taking 53 minutes to explain things the next day when that's what your experts are doing that I don't know was the best way to go. Now, you know, Kristen, you said he's very hands-on with everything in, in the political sphere being hands-on and controlling everything might be a good thing, but this, this isn't the political sphere. Like this isn't uh, let's make sure the platform is resonating with what my leadership is saying. We've got two experts who know what they're doing, know way more about it. Let them talk. That's what a true leader, not a political leader, but a true leader does, is that, you know, I stand up, I deliver this, and then I back away and let my experts come forward, you know, from from the very academic, small L leader, not party leadership, because party leadership, party politics, all that, a completely different set of rules. 
very annoying, but very different set of rules. <laughs> but okay, but can I counter this, Mark? Just if if there are the conservative voters that are not believing. I'm just going to play devil's advocate with you here. I'm, I, I, I do agree with you, but I'm going to just ask you this question. If there, if you acknowledge that there are conservative voters in Alberta that do not believe that this is as big of a thing, would you not want Kenny to at least continue that explanation the next day in some way, shape, or form? Well, I think he got to him the, with the evening presentation. I don't. If, if you don't think this is a big thing, you're not dialing in every day to listen to Henshaw. Okay, I, that's yeah. that's a good point. Okay. Well, and yeah, and just to, again to speak to Mark's point, like a lot of conservative voters, especially in the age bracket, in an older age bracket, they are not going to be on Twitter. They're not going to be on YouTube. They're not part of the six thousand to ten thousand people that watch Dr. Henshaw, but they do watch the evening news. Yeah. So they were covered off. They were handled by that by that address. The majority, I would say that a lot of people it would be interesting to see what people's responses to the televised address were versus other things in this particular situation because i think that would be reaching a lot more of his base yeah. than any youtube presentation that they could do any announcement that they could do and it is hard to do a powerpoint presentation on youtube and like especially when you can't really see what the powerpoint is actually saying that is confusing i will i will grant and agree with that for sure um and um yeah also to, it was like 50 minutes of a powerpoint like that's like the worst <laughs> grad school class of all time yeah pretty much like yeah. you know when you go to meetings and people spend the whole meeting explaining a powerpoint to you that you can read yourself because you're an adult human being that's what it felt like like okay Thank you for reading me something I could easily look at myself. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I can I can certainly see that. But uh, Mark and Kristen, did you have any thoughts on the actual content? Did you feel like, Deirdre, the sobering part that we're just in the beginning of this and May, was anything really surprise or jump out at you or in terms of the actual numbers that were presented? I'll say, I'll, I'll just jump in, even though I just yeah. finished talking. Um, <laughs> so I'll just talk some more. Um, I, I, I actually burst out into tears during the, physical, during the televised presentation when he talked about the end of May being when they'll, they'll begin to think about easing restrictions on us. Understanding, of course, that like that's what we have to do and this is what we have to do to make sure that those numbers they presented don't become a reality. But it is, it is an extremely daunting thing to think about going through this for two more months and to think, or three months or four months. Like that was the part that really hit me. The numbers were frightening. We're obviously frightening and there's scary to think about that many people being impacted or, or, or potentially dying. But it's, it's from a selfish personal perspective, it's like, holy shit, like I have to do this for another three months of trying to not lose my mind while I hang out in my small little apartment you know like that's i think for a lot of people that probably the reality of that hit home yeah that was that was exactly what it was for me too it was i mean even though i'm i'm paying attention to this every day i'm looking up numbers in the u.s i'm looking at what's going on in italy i'm looking at i i actually look at every province every day and what you know what's going on there i i do that every single day so you would have thought that I would have been better prepared to see that, like I should have known. I mean, they've, they've said before, the peak, you know, we're not going to hit the peak yet. The peak isn't here yet. <clears throat> Pardon me, they keep saying that. Yet when I saw that chart and I looked at it was May, I almost, I almost started to cry because that was when it really hit me. And I was just like, but I think also, because of the because the amount of information I am taking in and in all honesty, the scale of what this is, you don't want to spend a lot of time on that if you want to be able to function past that. So I'm kind of going and this is this is kind of what I realized because I was like, how did I not know that? Of course, I knew that. But I'm doing day by day. That's that's how I'm getting through. But yeah, March was March was long, right? March was March really long. We're already on the 11th of April. 
April has already moved a million times faster than March did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But March was really long. Yeah. March is always long. That was the worst month possible this could have happened because it was even longer. March was anyway. literally two months because you had the first 15 <laughs> days of March, which were like in preparation for the last year of March. So, <laughs> so yeah. yeah, March was actually like a million years long. Like yeah. it's, right. it's just terrible. But yeah, I'll look at it already. It's already the 11th of April. We're already almost halfway through April. <laughs> I mean, who saw that? Yeah, that's true. None of us, because we're all drunk. We're all drunk. Yeah. So, yeah, um, I'm going to jump in with a very different view of it. I, Because of my math background, I, I saw the early graphs when they're like, flatten the curve. And it's like, we're, this is going to happen for months. People, yeah. I, I was telling people weeks ago, it's like, don't expect to be out of your house before July 1. And they're like, oh, no, no, we'll be fine. End of April. July, July, earliest July. And now I'll, I'll tell people it's like we're probably going to, if they haven't done it yet, I still don't know why. Stampede's not happening. I'm not yeah. even sure K Days will be happening. Didn't they cancel the K Days? They did cancel K Days. Oh, excellent. No, they canceled the K Days parade. Okay, well, they're getting close. There, so, but okay, yeah. Just like, like I, I even scared a few Stampede people. Like, a... count on, count on your kids still being at home in September because even if we get this flat and we don't have a vaccine, and we're gonna go and send them all, all back to the human petri dish. That that's how that's the recipe for the second spike. I just I just yeah, like visualized they're... being able to choke you, Mark. I I was actually just sitting there thinking that the whole time <laughs> is. Wow, oh, and that's violent. What a violent reaction. Social <laughs> like <I'm> just distancing. Like... <laughs> Social distancing. Okay, well, sorry, Chris. It's a, it's a <laughs> hashtag unpopular opinion, but kids are going to be home in September. Yeah. Kids are going to be home until there's a vaccine. What? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, like, what you know what? I'm, I, I understand what you're saying, but I also... I'm hearing things from Bonnie Henry, not that this is like we're having a solution, but sort of an idea of not easing back into this, but like having some moments where we can get back to some sort of nor normalcy, acknowledging that, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're in this for a long haul. Yeah. Like I, I can you know i think i think what's more scary maybe I, I maybe kristen and i might be on the same page in this i think the fact that people are thinking or saying we're going to be a lockdown in 12 to 18 months straight that's viciously scary and frightening to me on i don't so many think it'll be 12 to 18 months the way it is right now i think yeah. it's going to be spurts and starts in terms of of whether or not we need to go back into this for a month or two at a time. And some things will probably fundamentally change. Mark is likely right about schools. I mean, until there's a vaccine, that makes no sense. But there is the ability to slowly open things back up with rules and restrictions. Like it was at the beginning of March, like before we all went into lockdown, yeah. they were starting to change the rules on restaurants and other places like that. So I think you are going to see dips and dives of this and, I don't know what the world is going to look like in a year to a year and a half from now, but we cannot as a society just cannot operate in lockdown with everything shut for a year and a half. That's just, un yeah. I don't know how that would even work. No, I, I'd agree with you that it's going to become different in the sense, like you're going to go to a restaurant and seating is going to be a third of you know, like the, the max uh, occupancy isn't going to be gauged anymore by the number of toilets or how fast we can, you know, the fire department can deal with things. It's going to be very much a what's your square footage and how many people fit within this. Everybody's six feet apart. Yeah. 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 Well, you're going to, you're going to see a lot more of that. Um, you, you know, you, the lineups to go into Costco. Um, I see a lot. I don't think that will go away anytime soon. I think you're going to see capacities for grocery stores and that being limited for, for the very uh, foreseeable future. So 
you know, they're, they're going to have to allow some things to come back. I don't know, you know, the schools opened up in the sense that um, if your birthday, you, you know, at whatever Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you come to class and then Tuesday, Thursday, the following week, like half the kids in the class and online teaching for the other. I don't know how any of that would go, um, but. Small uh, class sizes. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you want to go to schools and hire some teachers and. <laughs> Right. But you're but you're right, right? That's what they're there. There's no way that they are going to be able to cram 45 kids into a classroom. They won't be able to like safely. They will not be able to have them that close together. Yeah. And they are crammed. Well, well, and even like Dr. Henshaw said, like there there will be easing of restrictions depending on the zone and on the number of cases. So Cal- Calgary, so Calgary is Calgary. never going to come up. <laughs> yeah. So Mark's fucked. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, you know, even I look at like my my sister lives up in she lives in Yellowknife, and my niece, the put like my niece is in a class of five. There's five yeah. people in her grade, and so she might be able to presumably go back in September, <laughs> and which she would love because she loves school. I don't yeah, well, you understand. But I have one of those too. <laughs> um. But yeah, like, so I think in in communities like that, where it is quite remote, and there aren't as many people, there might be a different reality than in Edmonton, for example. Yeah. Yeah, that is, uh, so I mean, so some of the rural schools, um, because mine are in a separate school, so we had smaller class sizes. And rural just generally has smaller class sizes. Yeah. So it was, it was a benefit. Well, the other side is too, Deirdre, from your perspective, when restrictions are completely lifted or, you know, eased or like we're back to air quotes here normal for those that are not on Facebook, how, like at this point, how, how how eager are you going to be to send your kids back to that? type of classroom uh again it's going to be you know every everyone's situation is different um because my mother and grandmother also live with me that puts me into i've I've got a an additional responsibility for keeping that virus out of my house um and so you know i'm i'm not sure i'm not sure what exactly that looks like just yet um you know, the fact, again, I sort of think long term when we talk about, OK, how do we bridge the economy and stuff? But I skip all of the hard stuff in between where I have to make decisions on whether or not my kids can go to school. Right. Uh, yeah. Which is why which is why I had just that that incredible visualization of of hurting Mark there. It was it was really I, <laughs> it was it was shocking how easily it came oh, and it just oh. just stayed. <laughs> but in line, I'm sure there's a lot of people that like to throttle me. So not just for that but, comment. I just I make right. friends everywhere. <laughs> um, yeah, I just yeah, it's it's going to be it's going to be different, and everyone's going to have to um, to make that decision for themselves when that comes. Um, you know, in a way, I almost think there are some kind of benefits to the kids having, like, going from school all the time and to uh, now they're online schooling. They're going to have a little bit of experience with that, and I'm going to know which of my kids is better able to handle that to possibly have to continue it if they if they do need to or not. So, you know, we can we can look at it as a bit of a learning experience. Um, but, but yeah, like, what does normal look like anymore? I mean, I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't hitting a lot of places as it was, but, you know, I actually, I called in, I called in, uh, Charles Adler was asking the other night, what, uh, you know, what, what does this look like? And I started thinking about what, what got me out of the house was political events. We're handshaking, we're hugging, we are in small, close quarters. There's like, you know, sometimes thousands of people in the room. That has actually been kind of my, uh, my social life. So my social life are the extreme things that really shouldn't be going back to. Mm. <laughs> so, 
I mean, but I all enjoy this immensely. So, I mean, maybe I can handle it. I don't know. Well, I was thinking back yesterday to to what I was doing a year ago today, and like door knocking the hell out of places and like meeting right. meeting so many different people. And I loved like I love door knocking. It is one of my absolute favorite things to do. I don't know why, but I just I adore it. And <laughs> so yeah, it's it, it is. It's a definitely it's such a different world that we're in right now in terms of our ability to connect to people, but. I think everyone is slowly kind of getting used to it and this kind of stuff. And like, I, I've been video chatting with all sorts of people. I didn't even really talk to that. Like I'm reconnecting with all sorts of people. So there are some like really good things, I guess, that are coming out of this. Yeah. Try and focus on the positive and not the murder. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. Not the stabby stuff. Yeah. Oh, you're going to stab him. That's where you were going. I see. Yeah. 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 Uh, just quickly, uh, just back to Kenny here. Notley gave a response. I don't know if anyone had a chance to hear that. Uh, the one thing who that cares? Who, I... who cares? Okay. Oh, did you? Did someone listen? Watch that? Yeah. To not Notley's response to Kenny. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, she did Facebook Live like 15 minutes after he stopped. They do press conferences like 16,000 times a day. So. It's, it's constant. A good, keep, good way to pass the time. <laughs> right. I was confused. I was. I am confused about her smartphone comment. That was the one thing that I was a little bit oh. confused about. I don't sure if I understood what I heard. Is she said that she's concerned that the app would crash on phones? Did I hear that right? Yeah, that was a dumb thing to say. I don't know what the point okay. of that was. Oh, yeah. I, I, I like, I don't think our biggest concerns with an app tra- tracking our movements is, oh, my God, my phone. My phone might not be able to take all the government surveillance. <laughs> yeah. Uh, your phone has been fine so far. I'm sure it'll continue. <laughs> yeah, it's already happening anyway. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and actually, that is, that is an interesting thing. Mark, you were... Because... Uh, Okay, because that went, was that was that Wednesday? No, was that Tuesday evenings? No, that was no. Wednesday. That was Wednesday. She responded on Wednesday after the modeling. After the she modeling. She responded on Wednesday, but when did Kenny first mention I was watching it? It was on I Tuesday. I caught that when he said it. Was Tuesday. that Tuesday? It was Tuesday, yes. He said that they were, they were, they were looking at a smartphone app to track. To track okay. those who are not, that are to be self-isolating, that are not. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, so in Ontario, are you, taking, actually, are you taking their phone away and making them download the app? Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> yeah, like there's there's a lot of there's still a lot of requirement for personal uh, choice here. Yeah. Um, but Ontario has actually started oh, to. That is when... uh, they're starting to. They're sharing. Um, Ontario is starting to share some personal health information with first responders. So they're starting to, like when when people have tested positive but have gone home, they are now sharing that information. So uh, police are able to look when they get a call. They can find out whether or not there is somebody in that home, like if they're called for a disturbance or whatever, they can find out whether someone in that home has tested positive for COVID-19. So Ontario is starting to share that information with first responders. You know, this is this is kind of that situation where things are not the same as they were before, right? You have that expectation of privacy, you do, but your expectation of privacy your um, does not infringe upon the rest of our rights to safety. And right. So it, yeah, these are, these are, these seem to constantly come up as being in competition with each other, but uh, yeah, there's, it, it's not normal times. No. No, and, you, and, and unfortunately, I think that also what, what the premier had emphasized in when he spoke, but then later clarified because he was asked about it by journalists, was that this is something that will be done if people, again, are not following the rules. Mm-hmm. So if you are choosing to travel and then not self-quarantine, and that's happening more and more, and we're seeing an increase in those kind of things, and this is what's going to have to happen. This is all, all of this is based on the social, on a social con- contract that we all have with each other. And <laughs> right. if we are able to Sometimes. fulfill that social contract and, and 
do our part, then these kind of things won't necessarily have to happen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, so I, Mark, I, I, you, 100 language there, by the way. Right. <laughs> Mark, you sent me, you sent me Michelle Rempel's tweet. Well, I, I found it funny because Michelle Rempel was very much a, we need to be discussing uh, government intervention uh, and utilization of data this way. Uh, and so I've got Michelle Rempel, the conservative, going, you know, personal liberties and data and la la la. And then on the other side, I have conservative Jason Ketty going, we need to have the government doing these things. So <laughs> which one, which one's the government, which one's the conservative viewpoint? Well, and so, that, you know, that, it, it is, that's fascinating because I'm, I'm hearing, you hear that from Kenny, you hear that from Ford and yet here out in BC, the constant question that Bonnie Henry has been get, and Adrian Dix have been getting with an NDP minority government, I'll, I'll grant it's minority. Do you want? Do you need to enforce these? And their and their answer is no. They're <laughs> trusting that they're really trusting that people are doing what they are. They're trusting in the people. I I I, I have found the the response just so fascinating because it feels like Kenny's being more NDP and the NDP is being more what we think. It's it's you know the perception no, no, because with conservatives there's actually a lack of trust even though they want personal responsibilities but they don't trust anybody else to actually do what they're supposed to do hmm. they do regulate more on things like yeah like the like the health tracing that's something that would be um, you know that's that's the whole uh, uh, more check welfare uh, recipients, income support, things like that. Why does that come in? Because they don't actually have that trust for everyone else. They want that trust for themselves. They don't want government to infringe on their rights, but they're perfectly fine with infringing upon the rights of others. Yeah. But but it's weird. It's weird. You're right. Because, but that I think would be why. No offense yeah. to people who are like, yes, I'm super conservative. I'm very happy about that. But that's just a, you know, that's a, that is a big difference. And that's what we're seeing out of, yeah, we're seeing it out of conservative governments, but we're not really seeing that out of where you'd expect the NDP to get that. Yeah. I this still goes, don't understand what's going on in BC. This, this goes back to what you and I were talking about a while ago, your jury was, the, you know, named Mark's horseshoe is yes. that the, it's not a left right paradigm that the, the political spectrum is actually in the shape of a horseshoe that at some point you get pat it's, it's left, right on the political spectrum, but up down on government control. And at some point it doesn't matter if you're left wing or right wing, you want more government controls of how things are going on. Mm-hmm. And, Just not necessarily the same things. Yeah. And so yeah. this, this is, this is very much, you know, curling up on the let's have more government control uh but from a right-wing perspective as opposed to from a left-wing perspective yeah yeah um mark's horseshoe is famous yeah. mark really needs to get his wikipedia at a page done because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the horseshoe is the horseshoe is amazing it really is you should write a horseshoe doctrine Yes, the horseshoe, the horseshoe manifesto. The horseshoe manifesto. <laughs> well, it depends which side I write it from. It's a doctrine on one side and a manifesto. On the other. Yeah, you could become our leader in the new in the after times. Yeah, <sighs> nobody wants that. And for the rest of us, it's just an ins- <laughs> yeah. a guideline, yeah. an appendix. Yeah. All right, Deirdre, you, you what is what is confusing you about BC? Oh, I'm still confused at how how things aren't worse in BC. I I, I still am. Um, and 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 back to that. Okay, so back to that whole, you know, the the government intervention thing. I was really surprised that the BC government took longer to bring in some of these recommend some of these interventions that other provinces were taking on faster. Right, so BC didn't close their schools until March 17th, I believe it was. Yep. Okay, Uh, so Alberta was March 15th, uh, Saskatchewan and Manitoba, even though they were giving it till the end of the week or at the end of next week, but both of them decided to close their schools on the Thursday. Uh, New Brunswick decided to close their school the week before as well because 
whatever. But all of these governments that were starting to close their schools. Oh, did you freeze, Deirdre? No. Nope. Nope. Tell me. Well, you froze for a minute. Okay. I was going to say it still works when I talk. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, yeah, you have to tell me. (laughs) Um, But, yeah, so, like, you would have expected, you would have expected the NDP government to have been quicker on this. I was surprised that they weren't. They were making a lot of economic arguments around the time. um, But they were one of the first places where where the the outbreak happened. So So I I don't, I, and I don't understand how they're keeping... The case is down. I, I really don't. It's it's spreading faster everywhere else than it is in BC right now. So there is I'm, a really interesting... I'm, I'm not saying this because I'm certainly no scientist. Uh, but I'm not... Uh, but Ian Young wrote a really interesting Twitter thread around what is happening. And he saw people in Richmond wearing masks as early as January 8th. Now, I'm not saying that, I I want to be clear here, I'm not saying that masks are the reason that this is lower, but what I am... you're suggesting that there was an awareness going on much earlier. There was a high, certainly I think a high degree of awareness of what was going on in China that allowed people to prepare for what was... that. Uh, said we need to prepare for something here and i think that that is what might be part of the impact of why the numbers are where they are i don't think it's the complete picture but i do think that that has something to do with it because toilet paper and masks were being sold out as if i remember correctly it was at least mid-february that i started to notice that and that's how that's how we have to look at this is based on toilet paper stock. Yeah, that's I think that's a key component to this time. <laughs> when did toilet paper become When did the stock start to rise? Yeah, when did Yeah. Should have bought stocks and toilet paper. <laughs> Who would have possibly guessed? Yeah. But, but like that that might have a, a, something to do with it. Okay. But um, I don't know if, again, I don't know if it is the complete picture of everything, but it does I, seem like yeah. there was an awareness before. And that's what I was, I was trying to explain that to someone on Twitter in a Twitter conversation. That it's it's not that I think that wearing a mask is the reason, like people were walking around in masks and that's why the numbers are down. It's the fact that people found we're starting to prepare, whether that was purchasing things, maybe practicing some social distancing before we knew what social distancing was and starting to think a little bit about this is what we need to do. Yeah, it's possible. It's it's an outlier to me in, in seeing what has gone on. Uh, BC is this weird, it's this weird thing where things aren't, didn't happen the same way but you know you could be right there could have just been a better awareness within the communities that they were already starting to make some of these choices to stay in yeah Yeah. and that uh, because we know that works so maybe that's why but yeah that'll be that'll uh that's that is the analysis that i cannot wait to do once this is over yeah and specifically interesting that it is Richmond, which is a very much a very strong Asian community, lives in Richmond. And I think it's it is that I think that at the uh, one of the other things that's going to happen at some point have to happen at some point at the at this is an apology to a community that I think we generally belittled for taking the steps that they did, knowing what happened and where we are right now. Um, and I, I, I'm not afraid to say that I think that there was some racist tones around that. Yeah, there still is. Absolutely, there's still- there, absolutely, there's still, still not there. Yeah, the best, the best tweet that I saw, if we haven't mentioned it before, was the racist. Oh, oh there's echo. Yeah, there still is. Absolutely, there's- there absolutely. <laughs> 
someone's either recording me or we were all just like there's someone else talking it's me, it's me. <laughs> okay i now forget what i was gonna say so move along the best tweet you've seen oh right the, the one that said we don't call the we didn't call it h1n1 even though it started in yeah. a swine farm in america right so just saying we make choices yeah. <laughs> yes we do so like i'm just curious in alberta like where where did you see were things like this happening when did you start like to put the toilet paper standard as a when did you start seeing the sell out of toilet paper were there early preparations there in Alberta that you noticed looking back? It's, I think we all talked about this on the first uh, episode that we did, that it was kind of around that same, right, right before St. Patrick's Day, when things kind of, like the 15th of March-ish. The Ides of March was when things kind of shifted here. Because I, I personally did not take it seriously as a threat until probably like i said i think before when the nba canceled their season and when the nhl can when things started to cancel that's when i started to take it but i didn't think it was going to be this i would never have believed this like a month ago like but nothing in january february that you noticed no hmm. mark what about you well, yeah, it was around the same time. The, the question I was wanting to kind of dig into with this is, why is Calgary such a hot spot? Like, like you know, you, you, I was looking at the numbers for BC and for Alberta, and, you know, BC is kind of population distributed, as you'd expect. But 61% of Alberta's um, cases are in Calgary region. Yeah, mm. that's not 61% of the population. I've and got my theories, said, but I'd love to hear yours first. So, I saw someone who said that potentially because of the airport and because of international travel is more frequently in Calgary. Than, but I, mean, I don't know if that's the case. Like, I don't know what the differential is between the Edmonton International Airport and the Calgary Airport. Because, um, yeah, like I, I have no idea. I think the biggest thing that we, just as a broader comment on what's happening in Calgary that we need to take away from this is a conversation on how we treat our elderly and the senior citizens in our communities, because you're seeing that's where a lot of these cases are in Calgary. That's where a lot of them are in Quebec, Quebec, just in Montreal alone, 31 people died in a long-term care facility. And since, since a month ago, and I think we need to sort of maybe when this is over, start having a more substantive conversation about the way, that those facilities are run and the way that we take care of people in those facilities, because this to me is the biggest tragedy of all of this is a lot of these seniors are, are dying alone and without anybody there with them. Hmm. Just as an int- bring the mood really down with that comment. Just down. No, no, well, no, it's, I, no, I, I, I think that this, that is one of the enlightening things that I think sort of, the light bulb moments that are like just how we have treated seniors um, overall as is not. And I don't even know if, if there's a, there's a political perspective that can say that celebrate how they've treated seniors. I don't know. I don't know that maybe Mark and his horseshoe can explain that when he comes out with his doctrine slash manifesto and answer that question. But I, I mean, I, I think that that's, that's certainly something that, that can be opened up. It's Calgary has an, Calgary's average age, 37.2 years. Edmonton, 35.3. Is it a reasonable thing to suggest maybe a bit more of a senior population in Calgary is part of that? Or still mean more breakdown? Deirdre's got on mute. Oh, Deirdre, I think you're muted. You're muted, Deirdre. <laughs> We can tell that you're swearing. We just can't hear you. Yeah. <laughs> we got the thumbs up anyway. So. Oh, okay. Um, well, so while Deirdre is trying to figure out her tech today, um, I I don't know if it's so much an age thing. You know, really, when you sit there and say average age thirty five versus thirty seven, I don't know if it's so much that. Or I look at you know, and I mentioned it earlier, is that the the, the 
higher propensity of you not believing COVID is an issue and you voting conservative is seems to be hand in glove. And Calgary votes a lot more conservative than Edmonton does. So I'm wondering if this cavalier, it won't affect me. It's not my problem. It's somebody else who's going to get it. I don't need to worry about these things. I just want to go golfing. I'm wondering if that's the attitude that's why Calgary has got more uh, cases than the rest of the province. In within that number, though, there's if I I'm, I'm looking and thinking here too. There's one particular long term care home that is has a number there as well, and that's in Mackenzie Town. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Okay. But you know what? What part of that is, and like when I uh, when I was in my early twenties, I volunteered. Uh, I was a step student actually at a extended care facility, and I volunteered in an extended care facility throughout high school. And what you see and was the reality then and is most likely I'm assuming still the reality now are nurses are overworked. They are working sometimes 48 hour shifts, sometimes more without a break. You, they are consistently understaffed and like has been brought up, a lot of people support staff, especially travel back and forth from different facilities. We have never put the kind of investment into long-term care that we need to. Mm. Those facilities are, very, very, very taxed in terms of their ability to meet the needs of their clients because a lot of extended care facilities, the other part that we don't always talk about is it is not just seniors. It is frequently people who have Huntington's, people who have other forms of early onset dementia. There are a lot of people in those facilities who are extremely high need and there are never enough LPNs or RNs to to the number of clients and people in the facility. And so that what we're seeing now is an extension of that. We're seeing this explosion in some of these facilities of COVID cases. And part of that is because they are chronically understaffed and they are chronically unable to meet the needs of their clients anyway. And they try, this is absolutely no comment on the staff. The staff are incredible and do the best work that they can. But when you're exhausted and you're working three days straight, you're not your best self. And you also, and then if you're working between facilities, 48 hours on, you're even more exhausted. So I think we need to examine that because when we look at Calgary, that's where the chunk of their cases are. Like, I don't know how many cases or at least deaths have existed outside of long-term care facilities, but I think we need to look at this going forward and how we staff this and the importance that we put into these facilities because I remember working there and a lot of people were put there and then left. And there was not, and so we need to sort of really, re, really examine the way that we treat the senior citizens in our communities and how we value them. Mark, do you have a response to that? I want to. No, I'm, no, it's I. I was just curious. Um, explanation. Yeah, um, I'm just pulling something up here. Uh, I, um, while we're talking, because I, I I feel like he, here even in Vancouver, they there is a number in, higher in Fraser Health, and there would be other places too. So I'm I'm wondering that, but I do I, I know that Body Henry talked about that, was asked about that, because Ontario is is showing a concern of staff shortage right now, and they've they've been in a in a 400 number, pretty close to a 400 number for a really long time now, so. That burnout is going to hit. If it's not hitting, it is going to hit. So, you know, certainly this is something that I think we are going to have to see and, and deal with. I also just wonder in terms of Calgary if it's part because there's more potential for travel type of jobs there than Edmonton. Is that maybe another thing too? I don't know. Am I back? Yes, yes. you are. Yes. Welcome okay. back, Deirdre. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So my other thought was uh, money. Mm. There's people have like in, in Edmonton and Calgary, you've got more younger, also more uh, disposable income. You have more people traveling. There's a lot of money in Calgary. I know, I know that our economy has not been the most fantastic. There's still a lot of money in Calgary. And yes, as far as how many deaths have been outside of uh, long-term care centers, 
uh, Calgary has, I believe, had 17 from the Mackenzie Town Continuing Care Center out of our 20, 30 deaths. 40. That's today. 40 now. Okay, so 17. So 17 have been out of Mackenzie Care or Mackenzie Town. Yeah, and then there's been some long-term care facility deaths, or at least at least one, maybe two. Okay, so they're uh, not quite half, but possibly half. Right. But it is a more vulnerable yeah. population who is more at risk when that happens too, if, if, a, if an outbreak happens. I'm sorry, was that the conversation? Yeah. Yes. Are we still on that topic? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm just looking here. Henry today said very few cases under the age of 19, young kids relatively spared. Almost all deaths are elderly except one man in the 40s. Have seen shift to over 80 in number in 90s. Bulk of cases, 20, 40 age group reflecting healthcare workers, number hospitalized. Uh, yeah, keep, keep going. She also said a couple of other things here, but I'll, yeah, basically... Um, <laughs> Yeah, sorry, when I'm not making like a hell that. of a lot of sense right now, but yeah. yeah, anyway. And I missed it because I plugged in the wrong microphone or the wrong headphones, so. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I, I unplugged everything and had to plug it all back in, okay? So I'm still figuring stuff out here. I love how even in 2020, that's the solution to everything. Unplug it, yeah. plug it back in. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then I noticed that it was on my screen that I was muted and I couldn't find the anything to let me unmute it. It was good times. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> but yes, I did unplug everything and yeah. So I guess now that leads us to the conversation and, and there was an there was an article sent or column written this week in uh uh about the how the the coronavirus could potentially uh basically kill conservatism as we know it and a possibility of a recovery of conservatism uh maybe i'll start with mark because he was the one that sent us this what what was kind of your thinking on this what is your question around this deep dive what you're seeing and what your concern is here and then... yeah well uh, i i dear and i've been batting this around for a while and uh i'm i i wish i had an answer for it but a lot of the tenements that you know, big C conservatives especially have right now um, have gone out the window. Like I mentioned earlier, like Jason Kenney is now talking about big government and government oversight of people. That's, that's huge not, deficits. Yeah, huge, huge deficits. deficits. Like um, the, the, this is not how conservatives talk, or at least this hasn't been how conservatives have talked, especially for the last, say, 25 years. And and so we we know provincially and federally, we're going to have a huge deficit this year. We're going to add to debts. You can't come back and talk about, well, let's get into some austerity measures here. Let's cut back on health and education because those are two areas that people are not going to bend on after all of this. This like There's going to be a pushback. So, so then the question becomes, what's left for conservatives at that point? Like, I don't believe social conservatives will change their tune. I don't think anything coming out of this will change a social conservative. But what does it mean to be a fiscal conservative after this? And mm-hmm. Kristen, don't tweet that because that bad thing. Yeah, yeah, don't do it. Don't do it. I, I, I was already blocked by a few people. I don't do it. Well, maybe that's a good thing. You're getting blocked by those people. But, um, but I mean, like um, libertarians, how, how do you how do you campaign on a smaller government? When, like, you know, the solutions for everything is like, okay, everybody go get your $2,000 check. Like, there's there's so much going on right now that people can point at and go, had a conservative been running this, would these things have happened? And, and, and is the solution after this going to be some type of conservatism? Because otherwise, the conservative party is in real trouble, both federal and provincial ones. Like, I'm looking at it. Jason Kenney will likely get reelected because that's what conservatives do in Alberta is we just elect conservatives. We don't actually pay attention to what that means. But, you know, does Scott Moe have the same flexibility in Saskatchewan? Does Brian Pallister have the same flexibility in Manitoba? Doug can't go back to being the populist 
he's popular, but he can't be a populist anymore in Ontario. So he's a one and done. Who's going to lead the federal conservatives into, you know, <laughs> what are you presenting beyond, you know, like, you know, we've got Peter McKay right now who, you know, was the closest thing to a red Tory, but his, his media, um, Tom's team seems to be the opening credits to Monty Python and the Holy Grail. We will overcome diversity, Mark. Oh. Overcome it. Overcome <laughs> diversity, yes. Hey, have you guys watched Monty Python and the Holy Grail with all the yes. subtitles about the majestic moose? Yes. And then it gets really replaced with the llama. It's, 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 this is what Peter McKay's comms team reminds me of, is that horrible subtitling from Monty Python. Just read your goddamn emails before you send them out. Like, yeah. Well, <laughs> if if you, if you didn't have if you had a problem with diversity before you sent an email, you wouldn't have noticed it. <laughs> oh God, that's so that's terrible. the problem. Is like yeah, <laughs> that that might not have been an editorial boo boo. Uh, my heart. <laughs> um. Yeah. No. I mean. I think. We even look at the announcement that uh, the premier made uh, yesterday, I don't even know. Yes, yesterday, about infrastructure spending. So they doubled the infrastructure budget in order to to sort of work on creating more jobs and helping to kickstart the economy in certain ways. And that in and of itself is a huge shift from typical conservative perspectives like they they are investing money they are putting money and i'm sure it probably hurts their hearts a little bit to have to keep spending so much someone i can't remember who it was i was listening to a podcast and they said jason kenny will actually end up being the highest spending premier in alberta history which probably <laughs> really does not sit with him probably not no but it's it's what you have to do. And the reality is, as you look at the, the approval ratings for some of these premiers, Francois Legault is at 93%. Doug Ford is in the 80s. Like, this wow. is a, yeah, like, this is an opportunity right now. And Jason Kenney's at 67. So. Is that high? There, it's a time of national crisis, right? I mean, George W. Bush was, he had really great approval ratings after 9-11. So it, this, people look to their <clears throat> political leadership for stability. That is what we all do, whether or not we want to admit to it or not, in times of crisis. And so this is an opportunity right now, maybe for Jason Kenney and for the UCP, to re-examine their budget and to re-examine the way that they have framed things that were based on things that are no longer a thing, that are real. <laughs> And to understand that absolutely nobody, even the most hardcore rural Alberta conservatives, care about deficit right now. They care about getting through what we are, what's happening for us. And I think that any leader, whether it's Jason Kenney, whether it's Scott Moe, whether it's Brian Pallister, who I love, by the way, mm -hmm. if they not, if they don't listen to that, they will pay the political price for that. I think that that is that is just the reality right now. Is that if you don't listen to what people need which is to feel supported, which is to feel comforted, which is to get the supports that they need, then you will you will pay a political price for that. And maybe that will be what it takes to shift thinking for some provincial people. The federal conservative party, God knows, like I just, <laughs> right, like right now, honestly, keep Andrew Scheer. I don't even care anymore. Just like keep Nobody him. Nobody cares. <laughs> yeah. Like just, cause I, like Aaron O'Toole's got a little nuts. Peter McKay, as we've talked about, like who I used to love is like a dumpster fire. So just fuck it. Keep Andrew Shear, pay for his kids to do whatever they want, and just let's not talk about that for a while. Um, how much of that, though, in Alberta specifically, but really around every province that has a conservative premier? is going to be how effective the opposition is. Because uh, I personally think right now, my guess here in BC, if we went to a vote, I think it's an NDP majority, probably. And it would be close, but I still think it would be probably be an NDP majority. Um, but where do the opposition fit in this? Because I still think that part of, in Alberta, I... 
I know that the argument is is that a pen would be can come in as a conservative and win, but the NDP did win four years ago. You can we can debate semantics of it. Not this version of the NDP. No, not this version. Of the the, NDP. This, that, and that's that's the. I, I do think there's an appetite to have an opposition to con, the conservative, the UCP party in Alberta. I do think that. I think that the question is is how effective and what exactly does that look like. So I'm going to talk again because I like to sound my own voice and then I will stop and let other people communicate their thoughts. Um, the NDP won in 2015 because they were positive. That is one of the main things that helped them win the election is they had this positive campaign. They were, they were someone, you know, like the old school Barack Obama, hope and dreams, like aspire to hope or whatever his ridiculous cash rate was like that's, that's what you had with Notley in the NDP in 2015. That is not the, the NDP now. You do not see that same level of positivity. You do not see they're giving, like I said, four or five days, four or five press conferences a day. It is constant negativity. And I think for them, they need to back off. I'm not saying that some of the things that they're talking about shouldn't be raised, but I think that they need to back off if they think that they have a shot in the next election, because right now they're playing to the Twitter base that was going to vote for them already. They are absolutely not bringing anybody new on board. I think that the Conservative Party federally, for the most part, has done a really, has done a good job. They do need to call the government to account. That's their job. The NDP have done the same thing. I won't even acknowledge the block because I don't like them. Um, but what the NDP need to do is start being more productive in the way that they are framing things and they have not done that Deirdre you're muted again Deirdre you're muted stop playing with your microphone okay hands off <laughs> I, want hands I like did this. do that okay sorry there were kids playing basketball that's why I went to run and tell them I was still recording and then I forgot okay um, I, have a, I have a question though you remember Coming up to 2019, how many of the NDP uh, MLAs announced they wouldn't run again? Mm -hmm. I don't think I, I. I mean, I didn't expect them to be positive. We well, no, sorry, we did. We expected to see more of 2015 NDP in 2019, and why didn't we get it? Because I think they had been beaten down so badly over four years that there was nothing to be positive about. And I and I think maybe they're lost in that. So I I do agree that yes, they need to be more positive. I agree that's what was something that was so amazing about them in 2015 that got them all of the all of the recognition and all of the uh, interest that they managed to garner was because at that time they were different. They were they were positive. But and their positivity to, was And they also need to killed. stop like if I was advising the NDP and then I will stop talking and prompt mark. If I was advising the NDP, they would never ask me to do it in a million years. I would say, like, they need to stop trying to be everything to everyone and start Ooh. being the party that they that they fundamentally are at their core. They need to start. They need to get their like put on their big boy pants and start talking about a provincial sales tax. As difficult as that is, maybe right now in this current environment, in three years, I think that we need that. That used to be in their platform up until 2015. We, we need a way to pay for what's happening now, and it's not available with oil and gas coming back. Yeah, we're not, kaboom's not coming. Hey, Mark, sorry, I will, I will shut up. I'll just, yeah. Mark, tell us how right we were. All right, so. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> So I, I, we dug into the numbers, as we do as politicos, to figure out what happened in 2015. And you can see the turn at the debate. People, yeah. people yeah. turned because Rachel Notley showed leadership. She hammered the snot out of Jim Prentice, who was acting a little pretentious up there. Brian Jean was a robot. David Swan was out of his element. <laughs> So you're looking oh, at what, 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 what was happening through all that is that people were looking to teach the PCs a lesson. So had, 
had either David Swan, well, probably not David Swan, had Brian Jean <laughs> um, been more than the well, Rose will not raise your, no, taxes. Raise your taxes. Like, like, it, like the hashtag at that point was Brian Jean robot. Um, had he had any type of life in him, he would have been the premier. I mean, there, were, there was a time where we were talking, yeah. that we almost had Premier Danielle Smith, except for some colossal screw-ups in 12. People were wanting to teach the PCs a lesson for a long time. So being on the doors, especially in the Calgary area here, why did people go orange in 2015? It wasn't because of the positive message. It was they were teaching the PCs a lesson. They just didn't realize yeah. everybody else was going to teach the same lesson. They weren't, That's going, right. they, they weren't staying in the NDP camp. And I'll go as far to say as this province will never elect an NDP government ever again because that's as much as people might be more centrist than they realize that that brand is done here now the, i don't know if the ucp is brand is done here and jason's got some time to turn the ship um but if he doesn't now you know do, do i yell out at my alberta party friends and say get your shit together and uh yes uh and you have a chance maybe but there there's Dollars going to be in the bank. Candidates going to be in place. And really, the question was, what can the opposition do? You sit and wait for the government to shoot themselves in the foot. And if Jason Kenney continues to fight with the doctors and teachers in this province for the next three years, he's lining up to take multiple shots in his foot. Especially now. Especially well, even now. after, because we're going to hear, like, like you guys have said at different times, I can't wait till this is done and we can really dig into whatever. They will start like going on. highlighting how people have died. They'll be talking about how many doctors have died, how many nurses have died, how many frontline people. That, that will become a bigger number. And then all of a sudden, it's like these will become the faces of who the government is fighting against. And it becomes really difficult when that's your doctor and that's your nursing colleagues that, um, <laughs> that are dead. And it, you, you're getting less and less traction with they're getting paid too much after a pandemic. And, mm. and like I said last week, everybody's got their kids at home right now. They're starting to really value teachers. And come September, they're going to really, really value teachers. Right. So but I you, think can't, you can't go after these people. And so if you don't have a better solution other than let's balance the budget off of the, these two parts, you, you're, you're done. But I do think, you know, uh, to play devil's advocate a little bit, when this is over and we're looking at a huge chunk of the population who lost their jobs, there's going to be less sympathy in the general public for someone saying that they are getting paid five to ten dollars less per visit. I think that there will be some pushback on that narrative from people because everybody is hurting, and there will be an understanding, I think, from some people that, and that's what happened during during the last election was a lot of people said, "Well, we we've, we've been hurting for a long time," and we took those. I think a lot of people, especially on the left, took those voices for granted, and we and if that's done again, the UCP might get a little bruised in the next election, but they won't lose if other people don't take those voices seriously. Like economic, the economic downturn was happening before this and a lot of people have been hurting and a lot of people have felt frustrated. And so that needs to be given some room as well in this conversation, I think, because they tend not to have as much sympathy for some of those arguments. Whether yeah. that's right or wrong, it's just... Yeah, the, the, the Alberta Party, the NDP, the Liberals, whoever. I know there's one guy who was kind of pushing to have them all uh, congregate together. Whatever that looks like going forward, they have to have a solution for the economy. That's 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 the like we have heard for years and tops of years, if not decades, about how we need to diversify Alberta's economy. We never did it, and the NDP never did it. So I, I don't think there's a whole lot of legitimacy when the NDP stands up and says, oh, we need to diversify the economy. You, you had four years, yeah, four you didn't years do anything doing. with it. But um, it's going to be who's going to be bringing forward this next solution. It's better, And it's got to be big because rural communities need to know where their next jobs are coming from. Calgary needs to know where all those uh, you know engineers and geologists are going to go to work. You know, Edmonton's looking for their job. Like those, that's going to be a big comprehensive package. And like I said to Deirdre, like I'm waiting for Joe Biden to come up with the next new big deal. Because yeah. this, this is Joe going to be post-World War II policy radically changing how a country operates. But do you remember 
Do you remember what happened after World War II that made big differences? Lots of things. Yeah. There were lots of, there were lots of things. Yeah. I can't there say was I was alive. alive. The ground in Europe and... One of those lots of things, especially in the States, like this is not, this wasn't as big of a deal in places like Canada where we had affordable education. It was a big deal in places like the U.S. where people returning from war were able to go. Yeah. Yeah. It educated a whole bunch of people that otherwise probably would never have had access. What they ended up with that spurred all of that growth and all of that, um, middle class esque that that people enjoyed and that people aspired to was an investment in like a literal investment in people that it's it seems to be that what that people don't deserve that now they're not giving enough to get something like that but the thing is oh my gosh i just went full on socialist <laughs> <laughs> Warning, Sorry, warning, guys. warning. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw where that was going. <laughs> happened to all of us. But but it is, right? When you when you invest, when you I mean, the world saw some of their greatest uh mo- uh social mobility mm-hmm. after World War II and you just look at the money that they kind of poured in to different areas that that you know made that growth possible women's women working things like like so many things well, and, and i think i mean i think that part of that is what the Alberta government was thinking about doing when they announced that infrastructure bill so their idea being that this will help spur that kind of an economic development but that needs to continue both provincially and federally like we do we need to see a, a new deal around the way that we we work because we need to get all of these people back to work because the other thing that is going to happen when this is over, whenever that is, is we are going to see an unbelievable amount of people in need of addictions help and, and yeah. mental health support yeah. and all of the, like, <laughs> violence, like all the like, domestic violence, all of those things are going to skyrocket. And so we need to be able to provide people with as much support as humanly possible so that we can help mitigate the impacts of that. Yeah. It's, it's going to take it's going to take investments. It's not even that it's not even providing us with that bridge to get to the end. It's and after that, we still require this or we or we require this. Like it's uh, like I said, one day at a time. Little bits, little bit, little bit uh, that helps that helps me manage this. Right. <laughs> <This>. <laughs> yeah all yeah. all this all this <laughs> and the occasional this the occasional that's i mean uh that's kind so i guess now but i guess my, the other side of that is i wanted to ask what the future is in terms of progressive politics so we saw this week bernie sanders uh is not running for the Democratic nomination. Finally. Uh, he's, fine. Yeah, finally. Well, he, he said he's still going to grab delegates. He's still going to be on the ballot. He, he still wants to make sure that his policies are influencing what Joe Biden will present in the next upcoming uh, presidential election. So, but where are we in terms of where we're at progressive politics? So you even saw, like, you know, it was hard. it's hard to argue from a lot of people's perspective, that Bernie Sanders did not at least influence in some ways the way we think about politics, whether you like him or not, or whether you think he should have won or not, or you're happy you like him as a human, there seems, it's it's hard to say that he's had no influence at all. He oh, has no, I don't think happened. anybody's saying he didn't have Yeah, influence. no, no, I, I'm, I'm saying that, you know, as, you know, we, you know, if you like him or not, or if you're on his side or not, there certainly has been, an, he's he has made it, he has influenced the change, but where are the progressive? Where is the progressive movement now? I'm trying not to talk first. <laughs> Go, Mark. Mark. Well, I, I, I don't look at progressive politics. It's, 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 I'm, I'm a conservative. <laughs> like, like, a progressive. Yeah. yeah, like it's 
it's one of those things where, and I mean, especially like progressive politics in, in Alberta. I mean, I know there's a ton of people who would love that we had more of them, but sorry, that's just, we, we have, we have people in this province who want progressive things under a conservative government. <laughs> right. Bingo. Um, but I mean, in the States, I mean, yeah, I mean, you're watching someone like AOC. She's, she's got an influence out there. Um, they're, they're bringing more women into the ranks. Fantastic. I mean, and it's through that, um, wing. It's not so much the, um, Obama, Biden, Clinton crew that's bringing more women into the Democratic Party. It's, it's, no. it's much more the Justice Democrats and those that are backing Bernie. So there's definitely a, a strong influence in that capacity, and that's good. I really think there should be more women in politics. I am a big fan of Parody YEG and Ask Her, and more than happy to help any of them out. It's just, it's always for me, it seems really odd to have me sitting on one of their boards and, you know, <laughs> helping advise because I'm a guy and I don't want to mansplain, but. <laughs> I think I think when we talk about progressive politics, that means very different things in Canada versus in the U.S. So when you're talking about a lot of the things that Bernie Sanders was emphasizing, for example, national health care, that's just a fact here. That's right. not a progressive value. That's just a thing that we have and that no one, conservative or non, would be <laughs> So it's a very different thing. I think with Bernie Sanders, he has positively impacted the race, but I can't tell you the last time I was less excited about a U.S. presidential election. Like, I, I don't want Trump, and I, like every other normal human being in the planet, do not care for him. But I'm not exactly jumping up and down about Joe Biden either. So it's, it makes it very, like, right now, like, ugh. It's like, which guy accused of sexual assault is going to win the presidency? <laughs> my my fingers are crossed that Biden keeps to his word and he's going to have a female VP nominee. And I've got my fingers especially crossed for Kamala Harris. Oh, yes. I love her. I, I love I loved Elizabeth Warren. I th- she's, she is sharp, beyond sharp. She needs to be on the cabinet somewhere. Um, but I'm looking at if I'm the Democrats, I need somebody who's going to ascend into the president's role, possibly in four years. Sorry, Joe, you're not doing eight. Uh, no. And that's then it's not Elizabeth Warren. Just not like you need to have some somebody younger. And so you're looking Kamala at Amy Klobuchar be. or Kamala Harris. So if if America can put up with another black person in the White House, they've got some great future for them. So yes. So 2008, that was the last U.S. presidential election I was really excited about. No. Like, even Hillary. Like, I was excited to think that if a a woman could win the presidency, and I thought that that was, you know, I I, I think, like, a lot of people genuinely believed she was going to win. And I set myself up for a height of heavy drinking and a lot of crying when that did not happen. I was just shocked. I was, I was just I totally know. shocked. <laughs> I remember it sitting there and I was actually with a bunch of NDP people watching the election results. And I swear to God, I thought they were going to collectively like just throw themselves out the window. Like we were all just sitting there like, what just happened? Gay yeah. populism. Oh, God. <laughs> just the worst. Just... It really was. Oh, no, no, no. The the worst thing I can think of is that it happens again this year. So. Well, th- and that, that goes back to Bernie paying attention to Biden's platform is that, you know, you're going to need to have Bernie's bros stay on the team because they're, they're, they're ready to jump back to Trump again because. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. And just leave it at that. But, um, there, there's two. He's still got some influence with those guys, and you need them mm-hmm. in the camp. So, <laughs> gonna, they're going to have to throw Bernie a couple of bones. Those are the things that the Trump guys are going to jump on. But you know, for the the couple of 
uh, things that'll hurt them on the Democratic platform because Bernie's got them in there. Uh, Trump's record through this is is going to be worse, especially if he delays the election. Oh yeah, that'll that'll go over well. Um, or maybe he also like maybe he will find a private island as well with Dana White. Anyway, like Mortal Kombat all over again. Yes. Yes. Uh, but I, the other thing, like, when you were talking about the, what's happening with conservative, like, when Christian was also talking about what the NDP need to do, or especially in Alberta, I think one of the other things that I think where maybe the politi- some political left, not all political left, but some political left, is sort of taking these s- seemingly pot shots at the oil the people in the oil industry, especially in Alberta. And it's still, I still think that that has a huge effect. Like when the NDP were at, were at their, when they were being effective, they were standing up and understanding, you know, yes, we need to focus on, no one is going to dispute. We need to focus on climate change and environment and all of those things, but it's not to completely thrash the oil industry. And in when, fairness, in fairness, like the NDP itself, like the actual elected MLAs have not done that. Which, no. like they, they, they themselves have. They, they've said that there's a need to diversify, that there's a need to move beyond oil and gas in terms of the discussions that we're having. But individual MLAs have not, and that is an unfortunate uh, result of the political environment that we exist in. That people keep trying to frame the NDP as anti oil and gas. When in reality, Rachel Notley took that party quite to the center, to the center right when it comes to oil and gas issues. I remember her standing up at the NDP National Convention when Mulcair got kicked to the curb and she passionately spoke out against the LEAP manifesto. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She, and that has actually resulted in alienating a lot of their initial base. But she and all of the NDP have actually been quite vocally supportive of oil and gas. The UCP just like to say that they aren't because it's convenient and it's a nice little talking point, but it's not accurate. Yeah. But it, but the, you, I would also say though the NDP needs to do a better, needs to continue to educate that they're not, and I don't know if they have. But I don't know how you actually educate people when what the opposite was, and I can't believe I'm like passionately defending the NDP. I hope someone somewhere is watching this and thinking, Oh, it's all being recorded. Yeah, we're being yeah. on the internet um, later. It's, it's on the internet <laughs> even now, actually. But the NDP have done everything short of literally like writing. I love oil and gas on their bodies. And it's not enough to some people. It would never be enough. And it will never not be a UCP talking point that they're standing around with extinction rebellion and blah, blah, blah. And that stupid photo of Shannon Phillips, even though it's not Shannon Phillips, at a protest and all the like, that's been such a go to for so long. There is nothing that the NDP can do to combat that ridiculous narrative, but it's just simply not true. And if you speak to hardcore NDP supporters, they they hate that the NDP have been pro- so pro- <laughs> so, so there's like no win for them but, in this. Like, but it's it's not talking about educating the general masses on this it's like you know these are guys who sometimes are making up their mind who they're voting for when they walk into the ballot box not you know weeks and months before that and so there's this general belief the stereotype that the ndp is anti-oil much like the there's this belief that the ucp and conservatives are really good financial managers (laughs) which which, when you look at statistically and historically um our biggest deficits, with the exception of maybe Justin's and this year, um, <laughs> yeah, we run under a conservative know. government. And yeah. and so, like, it's there's these fallacies out there that nobody has a problem dispelling because the conservatives love that they're seen as the great money managers. And they're anything but. <laughs> Which just drives Mark mad. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so, I mean, like, we have to educate the uh, the electorate. Okay. <laughs> as soon as somebody yeah. figures that out, please let Get me out. know. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's some campaign schools I want to run. <laughs> yeah. I, can charge, I can charge for those ones. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is there anything I missed? 
Well, you did miss the internet for two days, so you know everything's happened. Yes, and everything <laughs> happened. On, yes, we haven't talked about speaking moistly yet. Oh well, I think you know you guys have spoken. Adrian's favorite song. I I want to. I just want to say you three did speak very moistly throughout this podcast. I've it was very <laughs> moist. These are the does, things. Does, does anyone need to hear it again? Yeah. I have it. Uh, I, I have that. I have that ready. Play it for us at the end. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, we. You... Mark's like, I hate this. I hate everything that's happening. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna ask Deirdre if she can come end us with a fun question before she at, speaks moistly to us. Okay. Okay. Something fun. Um. <sighs> I, oh, you're putting me on the spot here. Um, all that's all that's coming to mind is the headline that I saw recently, and I need a different one. Mark, any good headlines? <laughs> no, I would. I can think of one. Okay. So I'll ask everybody on the panel, and then we can put it out there to people. Who is your favorite guilty pleasure follow on Twitter? Ooh. Oh. Uh. Guilty pleasure, meaning I don't get a oh, uh, Brent Brent Tatoon. You're welcome. Tatoon, Tatoon. I don't know how I don't know how to say his name. Tarun. Tarun. Okay. I. Anyways, he's amazing. The first time I saw him, I was so turned off, and I just was like, "Ew!" Because he is because he's a he's a Trump supporter parody. But you have to watch the whole thing to understand that he is par- that he is being a parody of of some of the worst elements. Oh yeah, and he's he amazing. This- he's been amazing. Yeah, beard. Oh oh, which you know we lost half of it last time, so can't wait to see what happens next. <laughs> which I don't know if that's if that does that count as guilty pleasure. I mean, he's. Awesome. I don't know because like mine would probably be Derek Fildebrand. Like I. <laughs> Like half the time he tweets stuff and I'm like, why do I follow you? And I something today about someone who had like asked him for a job and then said, my resume will come at the interview. And he was like, not getting an interview. And I was like, yes. Or like, you know, the resolution will eat its own. That was my favorite Derek Fildebrand tweet of all time. So yeah, he's okay. my guilty pleasure. He's my guilty pleasure. I, every time he comes, like, he's never not interesting. And his, like, love, bro love with Shay Anderson is my favorite, one of my favorite things on Twitter. Hmm. Okay. Mark. Uh, you know, uh, I, go go to Deirdre and then, oh, wait, oh, <laughs> go to Kevin. I'm, I'm still flipping through my, uh. I'm still, I'm still I, thinking, oh, too. here we go. Vitor Marciano. Uh. <laughs> I, I I followed him, and today I wanted to reach to the camera and punch him. <laughs> so yeah, I guess he, I guess he's my Derek Fildebrand. So. He also makes great <laughs> baked goods. Baked oh. goods are baked goods. So like yeah, like 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 muffins. He brought oh. muffins to a Dubai party I was at once, and I was like, I'm eating Peter however you say his name's muffins. And then as I'm saying it now, it sounds dirty, but it wasn't. It was like a normal <laughs> eating of. Good, it was a made. normal eating baked goods. Okay. Uh, anyway, okay. This is like the hate follow one. It's like I don't follow people for guilty pleasure, and I don't follow people just yeah. to hate them. So, uh, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. For me, Ooh, how about Stephen Carter? Stephen Carter is another great one for. Oh. Uh, that wasn't brothers. quite the response. I was waiting for the fangirl <laughs> to go, but uh... he once said bad things about Joe Clark to me. So Stephen Carter <laughs> is not on my top ten list of people. So I you really hate have to him. actually be like physically uh, removed from his presence by Brock Harrison because I was like he was saying bad things about Joe Clark, and Brock was worried I was going to yell. Oh, so he, like, I remember this. Yeah. Yes. Okay, I remember her mentioning No one that. shit talks Joe Clark, Stephen Carter. Still flipping. I'm still thinking. 
Because there's some good, there's some interesting That's people. That's really close. Um, I also just follow like garbage, like celebrities sometimes. Just well, that's where I was and... thinking, and that's kind of where I was going. Is kind of like, like I, Doctor Pimple Popper. Yeah, like Britney Spears. Yeah. <laughs> Who also of... follows me? Thank you. Britney follows you. That's pretty yeah, impressive. That's pretty impressive. She really likes Alberta politics. I'm sure. <laughs> okay. Oh, I don't, I don't really you know, have, I don't think I have one of I don't those. I really have one. Um, I mean, Ish, uh, the guy from Suits, because sometimes he tweets about politics. Which guy from Suits? The hot uh, the one? Canadian one? The Canadian one. The Canadian one. That's the hot one. Okay. That's acceptable. Uh... Yeah, no, it's because he tweeted about politics. Like, basically, basically, I follow people based on the fact that they tweet about politics. If they happen to be a celebrity. Yeah, I don't follow a lot of celebrities. Yeah, no. I, I, really I do because I need, like a, I need a timeline cleanse. That's I fair. I just need someone to post about, like. I have like, sock accounts for that. I have oh, sock accounts. I don't. I need a sock account, I guess. You do. Yeah. Go through. Go through. Because I've I've been on my timeline and I had to get out of I had to go to a sock account and start looking for something fun because I follow too much politics and and journalism and stuff that it's dark. Would, would the so, WWE okay, so who's, be considered so a guilty go, pleasure? So here's my last question. I guess the who WWE would be my guilty pleasure. Follow who the WWE like over like oh yeah oh wrestling yeah okay so who's your who's your <laughs> favorite like. Who's your fun? Who's your fun <laughs> follow? Who do you follow that makes you smile? I think that's actually the most important question, so that we can leave our Paul like Ferry. five or so. Oh, followers. Paul Ferry's hilarious. Paul Gosh. Ferry at P A U L I S C I Pauly Sci. One hundred percent recommended all the time, all the time. <laughs> Jan Arden. Jan Arden is fantastic. Jen Arden is very uplifting and motivational and, and Which you feel good. Arlene because Wilson. Her, her songs are what I used to listen to when I was sad oh, to make yeah. me more sad when oh. I was like 14. I used to write poetry. I would write the like the most depressing stuff. And my mom would be like, Oh God. And I I'd know, be like, I no, think- this is good. This is fantastic. Look what I did. Did you Next see that? I should read my Don Iveson poetry during our sessions. <laughs> all right you know you want it i know i do i know i do all right it makes me want to make some nenshi poetry too oh Ooh, yes. i should do some kennedy stewart i should try to do Slam some kennedy yes. stewart poetry yes. i'm sure someone somewhere on twitter has written like some some very emotional john tory poetry Right? This could totally be a thing. Yeah. Okay, sorry, Mark. Sorry, Mark. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I really like uh, following because I'm in the beer sphere. Is uh, Watershed Brewing, Alberta's own brewery. And are they fun? Yeah. Are they? Are they? Yeah, there's some great conversations that happen, and uh, oh. he he constantly is making fun of. Um, um, uh, uh, Kent from Inglewood, the knife maker, under Knife Nerd. Oh yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. So, yeah, putting like Kent's face on on a shirt, and it's like I'm a cunt because that's what Kent had <laughs> typed or something like that. He's like, yeah, I'm a, <laughs> and so he'll make a shirt for it. So I can hear like inside Kevin's head being like, oh, the sea bombs happen now. Like I just this is this is <laughs> this not time. where I wanted this to go. Yeah, that's all got you. Yeah, so. So Kurt at Watershed Brewing, it, he he created a fake fake brewery, fake logo, fake everything. Um, oh. Got got props from Rachel Notley about you know uh, you know she did a, a you know throw out to all the uh, great uh, breweries in Alberta and she rhymed off a bunch, including Watershed Brewing. So uh, <laughs> he's like, I got that going for me still. So. Uh, okay, awesome. Uh, for me, it's probably Jillian Fisher. She she uh, she tweets more about hockey stuff. You got to look up her YouTube video. She's really 
she does like she does fan reactions to everything like for all of the teams and she's really positive and she's really funny like nice. yeah that would be probably one of my positive favorites. nice and funny is exactly what we need to spend our time yes at least at least at least checking in with once a day what yes because this has been it is very <laughs> it has been very heavy for sure and uh so but we're gonna leave you now to uh how do we follow what what do you guys got going on this week too like especially r and <laughs> What, for podcasting, what I meant, of course, we're, we're not going any further than um, six feet from our house, of course. <laughs> oh, uh, I, I I have a few, definitely a few coming up this week. Oh, I am talking with Trevor Toom and Blake Schaefer on Tuesday. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, kind of some Alberta politics. We're going to look at some economics because that's what they do. I may ask some inappropriate questions, but unlikely. That's what you do. You should, That's friend. what you do. I should, I but I more... shouldn't tell them that beforehand. I just outed more, my... I should ask more inappropriate questions as well, probably. <laughs> you should. Yes, I'll have to make a... Yes, I'm very serious. Uh... It's like, go ahead. I'm ready. <laughs> it's true. I couldn't offend Twitter more than I already have. Just by existing. <laughs> just by existing. Oh, that is so sad. Kristen, I'm glad, I'm glad you exist. I am too. And I was very glad that Kristen tried to, you know, bring that conversation onto Twitter. And, and I was really shocked at how horribly she was shot down for daring to ask such a question. Do not be surprised, friend. This is my experience. People find me confusing and therefore they yell. <laughs> Uh, I had another friend that had a, a very similar experience too, but uh, anyway, um, Mark, are you, Mark, okay. what, Kristen, I'll, I'll, we'll tell you after. Um, Mark and I are going to talk. Okay. Probably. Well, we're all going to talk. Don't pretend that we okay. don't like, sit there and shit talk people after this is over. <laughs> I don't, sh- I, I don't actually, I love all of you. Thanks to, by the way, to Kevin Hughes, who like commented throughout on Facebook live. Um, we will leave it there. Did, we'll, we'll did be... he even ask any questions? I po- I poked Kevin specifically going, you have an opportunity to ask questions. He so. said he misses Beth. <laughs> <laughs> he says put Beth on. Not Beth. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We, I do want to do, uh, it'll be interesting this, because a couple things that you talked about, I do want to do kind of in the future here, an economic deep dive. We'll also be doing a communication deep dive as well of how companies have been communicating this information yes. on COVID, and yeah, I have a guest. That's actually coming. a good one. Yeah, yeah, that is a good idea. Yeah, I have a guest lined up for that that um, will come on with just her setting a schedule. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, follow Kristen, Kristen Rayworth. Follow Mark at AB Mark Taylor. Follow Dear Dream Mitchell AB and Political R and D Mitchell underscore Pop. AB. Mitchell underscore AB. Maybe you guys can give your Twitter accounts, and I should shut up. <laughs> Well, you did good with me. Just, no, yeah, like I, I don't know if you even mentioned me, but I'm sure. That I did mention you, you actually. You were first. You did, but I mean, as someone who is very good at spelling, you need to spell that out. That's true. Okay. People yeah. Never know how to spell my goddamn name. No. They always spell it with an e. It's not spelled with an e. Twitter. <laughs> so if you're trying me to with a y, I would have picked a y. I would have picked a y. Oh. oh. Rayworth. We need to have an offline conversation about the weird you spell. Yeah. And I am at KB OLE. We're going to have our on- offline conversation now. Thanks, everyone, on Facebook Live and on Spreaker. Thank you. We'll talk to you all soon. Bye for now. Oops. <laughs> I don't know what's you going on. You physically jumped. Hang it on. won't stop. It will not stop. Is it that is actually stopped. the case? It is stopped. Okay. On Facebook Live, <laughs> it is not on Twitter yet. Let me. Oh wait, it's not. Stopped. <clears throat> Damn it! It's stopped. not stopped. Yeah.